Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear respected brothers, sisters, and viewers. Before we begin tonight's show, we'd first like to send our deepest condolences to the Imam of our time on the martyrdom of Imam al Jawad alayhi salam. Now, for those who are tuning into today's show, on Friday's show, we discuss the topic of spouse selection and marriage. And inshallah, tonight will be a continuation from that, going through some of your questions to begin with, as well as more of the topics to discuss, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyidina. Thank you well, for assalam, joining well, us well, once again. We discussed in the previous show finding or securing a, a future partner. And since then, we've had a question that's come in that says, I met a non-Muslim at work and I find that we are very compatible. Is there any way that I can marry them? If not, what do you advise? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Firstly, our condolences to the whole Ummah on the night of the martyrdom of Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam. When it comes to the question of whether a Muslim woman can marry a non-Muslim man, First and foremost, let's make clear, in no way is the answer to this question a disrespect to people of other religions at all. There are people out there of other religions who are the most trustworthy, the most dignified, the most respectful. But in Islamic law, the law is very clear that a non-Muslim man cannot marry a Muslim woman. And that is taken upon the idea that when that family begins to grow, while both will have a say when it comes to the spirituality and the theology of the children, the father is seen as the breadwinner, the father is seen as the patriarch, the head of the household. And even if we were to say the father would not have more say than the mother, let's say the mother has more knowledge on religion than the father, there's still going to be disagreements occurring over which religion for the children to follow. Therefore, that person who has met someone at work, who they may say, that person who I've met is a wonderful person. There is no harm discussing with them the religion of Islam. As in if I, for example, have a sister who comes to me and says that I'm a Muslim and I've met a Christian at work, who's a wonderful human being. And the Quran mentions to us in chapter 5 verse 82, that the Christians are the closest to us. As the Quran states, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, لَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارَ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ مِنْهُمْ قِسِّيسِينَ وَرُهْبَانًا وَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ You'll find the closest people to you in reciprocal love, means two-sided, two-way love, are the Christians. Because from amongst them there are priests and there are monks who are humble human beings. There is no denying that that person may be a wonderful person. But also, when you're in a relationship with them, where you feel this could go further, why not bring them to the mosque? Let them openly discuss Christ and their opinion on Christ, our opinion on Christ. Let them discuss their understanding of the Quran. Maybe they have misconceptions about the religion of Islam. So, while in Islamic law, a Muslim woman may not be allowed to marry a non-Muslim man, that does not mean that we cannot have an open discussion with that person who you feel is a wonderful human being so that there could be a possibility of them coming towards the religion of Islam. I've seen many cases where Muslim women have met non-Muslims at work, at university for example, and they told them that legally there is no chance for us to be married unless you revert. Some of those may have reverted simply to get married. There's no problem there at all. You are no one to judge if a person has reverted simply to get married and they've recited the Shahada. The rest is between them and God. But one thing I have found is that if you're going to tell that person to revert so that your father accepts that person for giving your hand away, don't be a hypocrite when you're now living with that person. Because there are certain Muslim women who told their, their, their future partners, you have to revert, my dad's never going to accept you, never going to accept you unless you revert. That person reverts and then notices she doesn't pray, notices she may not fast, notices she hardly goes to the mosque. And then that person turns around and has every right to say, why did you make me join a religion which you're not so passionate about? 
So while in Islamic law it is prohibited for a Muslim woman to marry a non-Muslim man, this does not mean that we cannot build towards a relationship somehow where theologically we can come into agreement with one another. So another similar question to that, I guess, which is closer to home, if anything, is uh, coming from a Shia brother. He says he's in interested in marrying a Hanafi sister. Mm. Is this possible? Once again, there's, there's an overlap in the answer. What's the overlap? You've got to be practical in looking at the future of the children and what path those children are going to adopt. Marriage in itself is going to bring a number of tests, a number of questions, a number of debates at home, let alone if one of you admires certain personalities that others don't, practices certain practices that the other side doesn't. In Islam, and when you come to studying Islamic law, anyone who says, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, believes in the oneness of God, believes in the fi finality of the Prophet of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, that person you're able to marry. However, on the practical level, do these people agree with your theological principles? If you say, well, let's agree to disagree. So when the children grow up, which concept are you going to take? If that person completely rejects the concept that you completely believe in, or that person admires a particular ruling authority and you completely detest that ruling authority in Islamic history. Or that person, for example, you want to take your children to the mosque in Muharram to listen to the majalis, the lectures on Imam al Hussein and what's happened at Karbala and lectures on the Quran. But that person may come from a particular ideology that says, don't look back and discuss these things because these cause fitna. Therefore, if the person is asking me, that they are a Shia and they want to, they are a Ja'far and they want to marry a Hanafi. In Islamic law, this is permissible. However, on the practical level, a person has to ask practically. And that's why what I advise is, if the two of them do want to get married to one another, before you get married, go and visit the respective scholars of, scholars of your community. So that that Hanafi sister knows what that Shia believes in its entirety. Don't tell me that you both enjoy Eid and you love Ramadan. That's, that's neither here nor there. I don't deny, yes, Quran is the same. The Qibla is the same. Hajj is the same. Fasting in the holy month of Ramadan. These things are important and there's a lot of similarities. However, there are also differences. If you are both able to accept these differences, knowing all of them, knowing that, for example, the Shia are those who, for example, mourn Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in Muharram, and that you are ready to attend the lectures every night, and that you are ready to be alongside the revival of the practices related to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and that you are ready to accept your son's being named after certain personalities and definitely not being named after others, for example. And you're able to accept that there is a possibility that your children will have to pray in a certain way and so on. If you're able to accept all of these things, then why not? But don't come three, four years down the line in the marriage and say, I didn't know about you, this. You didn't tell me you guys believed in this. The number of Shia Sunni marriages which have been successful can be seen. But there's a number of Shia Sunni marriages which have been unsuccessful. And sadly, the divorce is a divorce which involves children. So I believe that there should be a course which is held just before the two get married, where they're open about everything they believe in. And then after that, they can make their decision. Make the decision. Yeah. I guess another point is going on places like Ziyarat, for example, like you mentioned, they might go on Hajj, but to visit some of these holy sites, one sect believes it's Bid'ah or Fitna, the other sect actually believes they can take, uh, you know, have their du'as answered, for example, from there. Some people who aren't fortunate enough to meet their spouses at work or at university often get pushed into these arranged marriages. For example, we have in some Asian communities in villages where people might be arranged to marry someone they've never met before. 
What does Islam say about that? It's very sad when I hear that in, in parts of India, parts of Africa, in parts of Iraq, and parts of Afghanistan. It's very sad when you hear that there are girls who are arranged to marry someone they've not met, someone they may not even desire, and someone they probably will not be able to communicate with until the wedding night. I'm not going to deny that there was a generation which may have involved our parents' generation, where as much as you got was a photo, you said yes, and then you see what happens with that person in the hope that you can build the future. But if you're looking at Islamic history, and you're looking at Islamic ethics, there is no doubt that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, and the prophets who have come before him, are involved in a dialogue with their daughters when someone has come to propose or if they want to take a proposal forward. Because you know in Islam, the culture may either dictate that the man goes to propose for a girl or there may be a situation where a girl asks her father to go and propose for somebody. In the Quran, Sayyid Jabir, let me ask you, where in the Quran is there a father who goes to propose on behalf of his daughter or daughters to a particular prophet of God who his daughters have just met who helped them take some water out of a well when there was a group of men surrounding that well? Let's see if you know the answer. Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Well done. I got you out of that one. Prophet Musa alayhi salam and Nabi Shu'aib. Nabi Shu'aib, Prophet Shu'aib. His daughters, when they return back, having seen Nabi Musa as a respectable figure, upon their return, one of them has asked their father that we have found the man as someone who is strong. He helped get the water out. And someone who is trustworthy. Trustworthy in the sense that that person, when we walk back home, that person didn't go overboard in his conversation with us. Rather, that person was respectful in the way that he spoke to us. The Quran mentions in chapter 28 from about verse 20 onwards, that Nabi Shu'aib having had that dialogue with his daughter, sees that his daughter has an interest in this person. He doesn't tell her, you are going to have to marry your cousin and you have no choice whatsoever and if you don't we'll pour acid on your face we'll burn you we'll kill you you know there are parts of pakistan and parts of afghanistan and parts of iraq and parts of africa and parts of india where the girl is told that if she does not marry that particular cousin who's been chosen for her then that's it that girl is in trouble she will possibly be excommunicated if not killed nabi shu'aib alayhi salam in the quran islam wanted to make a clear point that there's a dialogue which takes place. Imam al-Sadiq says, the right of your uh, daughter, the right of your children is that you engage in dialogue with them. He has a dialogue with his daughter. He could see that his daughter has an interest. Not that I'm going to force her to marry Musa. No, clearly there's an interest. When he sees that there's a clear interest from his daughter, what does he do? Take the proposal. What does he say? He says, I want you, if you don't mind, to marry this one daughter of mine. And as part of the dowry, eight years work for us. So you find here that Nabi Shu'aib alayhi salam witnesses that why not take a proposal from my daughter towards someone you know normally in our communities you'll have people say never they've got to come to us we'll never go to them they have to beg us no nabi shuaib highlighted that listen you find someone who's a catch don't sit back and say you have to wait take the proposal and see what happens on the other hand you find the holy prophet muhammad peace be upon him and his family when it came to his beloved daughter fatima's marriage he could have easily said, you know what, Fatima, you have to marry so-and-so, you have no choice. The Arabs used to give their daughters away to whoever was paying the highest dowry. It wasn't a matter of whoever she wanted to be with or whoever she loved. It was a matter of who was paying the highest dowry. That was their concern. And what you find is 
that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, sees that there's a number of people who've come to propose. When you have some media outlets saying Islam, the religion where you're forced to marry someone, the man himself who is seen as the head of the religion of Islam, who God reveals his final word to, does not tell his daughter that you've got to marry Abu Bakr when Abu Bakr proposes, or Omar when Omar proposes, or Abdul Rahman bin Auf when Abdul Rahman bin Auf proposes. When Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, proposes to Fatima al Zahra, السلام, the Holy Prophet makes it clear I will go and ask Fatima. Let's see what Fatima wants. And her silence was her approval. Therefore, you find that those who are forced into arranged marriages, this is the biggest oppression that can take place. Sometimes in our communities, people imagine that when two people get married who hither to that point did not know each other, that's arranged. No. On the contrary, you may find someone in the community who can arrange for the two of you to get to know each other. There's a difference between arranging a meeting between two people and arranging or forcing two people to get married to one another. Inshallah. So following on from Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi, how was his marriage built or arranged with Hazrat Khadija Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi? Well, what, he, what were their relationships? He like? of course works with her and um, it's beautiful because he works for this woman who no doubt has a, has a fundamental position in early Islamic history. She's got these wonderful names already uh, in early Islam. She's known as uh, Tahira, the pure lady. She's known as Amirat Quraysh, you know, the, the, the lady who was seen as the princess, for example, of, uh, of, of, of Quraysh. And everybody reveres her. Everyone's revered her father, Khuwailid. Uh, these are all families who are known as Hanifs. They've stayed on the Abrahamic path. They've never disobeyed in the sense that they've never uh, worshipped an idol uh, or ever been affected by polytheism. And he works for her. And when he works for her, he's still this young man in his mid-twenties who's still humbled and awed by her presence. And at the beginning when he's told to propose for her and when she's told about him, both of them, their answers are the answers of humility. This is sometimes you could turn around and say, Who's this person to come and propose for me? Or who does this person think that they think they can have a chance in marrying me? The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, seen as the absolute embodiment of, of, um, of knowledge and absolute embodiment of humility. And it can be seen in these moments because he doesn't see himself as being, oh, I can marry her easily. You know, just I'll point my finger and she'll marry me. On the contrary, you find that there are matchmakers involved. There's the ladies who work alongside her. There's Abu Talib السلام, on, on, on his side. And, and they don't shy away from telling each of them, what are you guys waiting for? And sometimes those matchmakers, you need them. You need their push. So with the Prophet and Sayyidina Khadija, it wasn't the Prophet Muhammad directly going to her one day and saying, I want to propose for you. But rather there were people who were around who begin to institute what later becomes an extremely wonderful act of piety, which brings upon Allah's mercy, and that's bringing two people together. We underestimate how much reward there is in the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt for those who bring two people together in marriage. From the rewards of heaven being guaranteed for them, to the rewards that Allah's mercy depends on that person. To the rewards that the angels seek forgiveness on behalf of a person who brings a couple together and gets them married. So you find with the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, and Sayyidina Khadija, there were a number of people around them who were involved in matchmaking and bringing them together. So in terms of matchmaking then, how far can you go to make sure a marriage happens? Because I've heard, for example, with... Ghiba is obviously haram and not recommended to do, but if someone comes and asks you about a specific person that they're interested in marrying, you can almost be an open book about them. What does Islam allow you to do with matchmaking? How far can one go in that sort of situation? Well, I don't think matchmaking is only about giving references for people. Matchmaking is also an awareness 
of those in the community who may be single, those who may be divorced, those who may be widowed, from the male and the female side, and are looking to get married. So the first step is building a database of people in the community and a database of confidentiality that whoever's going to run the matchmaking site or the matchmaking group in the mosque has to be someone who is known to be a person who can keep the people's secrets because this is the people's private lives. They've already probably been through an extremely sensitive time, either not getting married, which for some of them is so difficult to take, understandably, or a very difficult time, for example, after a divorce, or after the loss of a husband or a wife. So the first thing is to get this database of people who can trust you, you trust them, then to get three, four members of the community who you know very well can work alongside you because they are people of very renowned social circles. That's an area which is fundamental. That we have people in our communities who don't realize just how many friends they have. They may have so many friends out there and they may know that this person's looking for a wife, that person's looking for a husband. You know what, let's try and bring the two of them together. Now, how do you bring the two of them together? That's the third area. Maybe you, you pick the house of the one who has uh, collected this database in confidentiality. And maybe 5, 6, 10, 15 people come together. And if you, for example, click with someone, then you may mention, for example, that you, there may be number tags and things like this. And I know certain people laugh at these things and some people say, well, you know what? Uh, I don't need to go through this process. You may be fortunate to be part of a community where you're surrounded by people who are lovers of Ahlul Bayt, let's say. There are certain people who belong to communities made up of 10, 15, 30, 40 people. The father, for example, had to move to get a job somewhere in the middle of nowhere. They bought a few Iraqis, a couple of Pakistani, a few Iranian, Lebanese, Afghani, reverts, this India. They brought them together. They made an Imam Barrio. They made a Husseiniya. They made a jami of 40 people, 50 people. You're not going to find all of a sudden for your three daughters, three guys. If you're, if you're fortunate, alhamdulillah, but it's very rare. So you need this database. Now, whether it's online, whether it's face to face, it is an act of piety and it should be done. And I sincerely believe in these things such as the speed dating, you know, if a person is able to organize a program where people can come together, you talk to each other, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, is there a click, there isn't a click, you move on and so on. Why not introduce more and more people together, bring people from different cultures and different backgrounds. If there is someone out there who says, for example, why you say the traditions say that God's mercy descends on the one who brings two people together. If they say to you, okay, the Ahlul Bayt salam, did anyone seek a matchmaker from them? It's an interesting question. If you look at the Ahlul Bayt salam, I would say Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, one of his marriages was matchmade. I would say Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas salam's marriage to Lubaba was matchmade. I would say Imam al Hussein's marriage to Sharbanu was match made. Either they used the Imam present in their time, Abu al-Fadl with his brother, Imam al hussein with his father, or Imam al hussein uses his own brother Aqil. When Imam al hussein when Imam Amir al-Mu'mini sees that Fatima al-Zahra has passed away, and he sees, for example, that he's got these orphans at home, they're young, and he wants to marry someone. He marries Asma bin Umayz, for example. He marries Khawla bin Ja'far. She gives him Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. But then he asks his brother Aqil. Aqil used to know the Ansab, the genealogies. And he asks his brother Aqil, he says to him, Find me a lady who from her ancestors there are the bravest of warriors. I ask you, Sayyid Jabr, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Could not himself just find someone? We don't believe Imam is the gate to the city of knowledge. He could, but then it wouldn't be a lesson for us ah, today to find. The Ahlul Bayt, every aspect of their life is a lesson for us. Aqil said to him, Aqil used to uh, place uh, like a, a, a mat in the mosque of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family in Medina. And people would come and ask him about the different ancestors. And so 
Akil said to him, he said to him, give me a month. I'll get back to you. When he later comes back to him, he says to him, there's a lady, Fatima bint Hazan. And this lady, her ancestors are the bravest warriors. Now, nobody knows bravery like Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, from a mile away. He knows your marhabs. He knows your Amr ibn Wudd al-Amaris. You know, he's fought some, some warriors. That. Yes, he's fought, you know, he's fought Utbah bin Rabi'ah. And he's fought others of that ilk. So he says to him, he says to him, shall I mention to you the names of some of her ancestors? Now this is a matchmaker. What's a matchmaker do? Matchmaker can see someone who's looking to get married, asks them the criteria. And then after that, there's a hope that, Ya Allah, bring them together. Ultimately, it's Allah's mercy when two people come together. And so, you find that he says to him, Amr bin Sa'sa'a is one of her ancestors. Now, Amr bin Sa'sa'a as a hobby, used to go out in the deserts to look for wild animals. Me and you would run away from a wild animal. Amr bin Sa'sa'a used to go, is there any more wild animals that I can go after? I don't want to mess with this guy. And I certainly don't want to mess with his descendants. He says, who else? He says, Mullah Abil Asinna. And when Amir al Mumini hears these two names, he knows, yeah, her family, not to be messed about with. And eventually she is known as who? Umm al Banin. And she gives him four of the most noble, honorable sons any human being can have. Notice how I put noble and honorable. I don't need to always talk about bravery. Abel Fadl, above all else, noble. He's a noble human being. People always say, Abel Fadl, sword, fight, war. There are many who achieved swords and fights. But not many can go to the Euphrates and turn around and say, how can I drink the syrup of this cold water while my brother drinks the syrup of death? So, there exists in our history. And that's why when I hear in our communities, that there are people who are bringing people together and you hear some people laughing, what's this, this nonsense, they made this app, they made this site. On the contrary, I have full respect for those. I believe that they continue to follow the path of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, in trying to bring members of our communities together. And you know, the way the world of marriage works is unbelievable. As in you sometimes imagine, well, there's only one way and that is, for example, if my mom knows someone who knows someone, then maybe something can happen. You know what? You may never have imagined that that would be your future partner. But then someone told you, did you know down the road, down the street, in this area, on this area, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest of planners. And so let's try and incorporate more of this into our communities, inshallah. So with, with these apps or websites, what's the correct way of using them? I mean, some people might take advantage of such an app. Habibi, I'm, I don't care who takes advantage. It's none of my business. You know, you, you at the end of the day, if you're looking to get hitched, here's an option and that it's on an app. What you and that person decide to do between each other, how it goes, where it goes, not my responsibility. My responsibility was to try and get you two together. After that, you go out for lunch, you go out for coffee, you go out for dinner, you click, you see where it goes, will it head somewhere, does it head somewhere, that's between you two. All of us have different responsibilities in life. All of us have different tests in life, which doesn't mean that the couple didn't click. It just means that there are certain other issues which led to, for example, the two of them not necessarily getting on. There are some who've tried to work with matchmakers for three, four, five years. On the sixth year, they may have met someone who they never dreamed of meeting. If you have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then there is nothing wrong in using these apps in whatever way you want. Islam was flexible in the way people get to know each other. Our culture is what's backward. Inshallah. Thank you for tuning in to the first part of the show. Inshallah, we'll be back for the second part to discuss more on the topic of marriage and spouse selection. We look forward to seeing you after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Dear respected brothers, sisters and viewers Welcome back to the second part of our show tonight Where we're discussing part two of the topic of marriage and spouse selection With Dr. Sayyid Amman Akshwani Sayyidna, before the break we discussed things such as intra-religious intra marriage, inter-religious marriage We talked about matchmaking, uh, what, what's allowed in Islam, what's not allowed The use of apps for example now let's say two people have come together, it's in their engagement period and they are having difficulties of, of, of an unknown nature, for example, between themselves. They had chemistry but now they don't. What would you advise to them in that situation? Well, naturally it could happen um, and rather happen in the engagement period than after the wedding. I think what happens is, when there is an issue in the engagement period, you both have to look at yourself hard in the mirror and ask yourself the question that are we really suitable for each other? Are we compatible? And do we really want to live the rest of our lives with one another? Normally the engagement period is seen as the easier period because you're not living under the same roof. So it's a bit more flexible. Those responsibilities haven't just suddenly come upon you. But I do believe that there are many people who see problems in the engagement. They hope that, you know what, I think we can make it into the marriage. Even though they've seen clear issues in the engagement. And then they end up with the title of being divorced. If you could see that there's a major problem in the engagement and... You've worked to try and solve it. You don't just give up, but you've worked to try and solve it. And it still seems to be an issue. I think calling it quits in the engagement is a lot different to calling it quits after the wedding. In the engagement period, you, you break up, you were engaged and broke. But after a wedding, you're divorced. Also, there are certain people who get engaged, for example, in the Iraqi community. Some people, when they get engaged, they do what is known as an aqid or a nikah. That means that when they break up, they're divorced. What my recommendation is to the communities out there that the engagement period should be a mut'a agreement, a temporary period. Where, for example, the guardian of the person who you want to eventually be married to permanently sets conditions where you two are able to meet in that period, be together, but there are certain restrictions that are made. You get to know each other in that period in a halal way because you know, you want to get close to someone physically. You want to hold their hands, you want to hug them, you want to, for example, go out with them and so on. Naturally, you want to make sure that everything is done in the appropriate way. There's no physical touch without it being done under a legal contract. So my recommendation is that yes, you may find community pressures dictate to you that now that you're engaged, you have to go the whole way even though you could see problems in the engagement period. You have to go the whole way because people will say, oh, how could you break this engagement and so on. If you feel there is an issue in the engagement period, which both of you try to resolve and still not resolving, end it there and then. If, however, there is an issue and you both feel you could resolve it, then try and take an advice from people of wisdom out there who can tell you how to approach these issues in a way where they could be easily resolved. There's different types of issues that could come up in the engagement period. If in the engagement period you see that your partner, for example, drink certain things or smoke certain things then you know that this could be a major issue later on if in the engagement period you're not happy that your partner wears for example tweed suits or you're not happy that your partner's shoes are brown or you're not happy that for example your partner supports a certain football club or something like this these aren't issues to break an engagement over but still I believe that if there is an engagement to be broken it's it's a easier lesson to learn than when breaking a marriage. 
So in the engagement period, like you mentioned, certain people take part in an aqid or do nikah. That comes with a mahr, obviously. Yes. So what kind of mahr is acceptable in Islam? Because if you, you know, certain people think if you place it too low, it devalues your daughter. If you place it too high, if there is genuine problems to get out of and the guy can't afford to pay it back, then it's on his neck and he feels like he's somewhat tied to the marriage. So what's Islam's outtake on that? Well, Habibi, first and foremost, we can't be uh, looking at marriage like it's a, a, a transaction between a product at one supermarket to another. Value this, value that, stock exchange, put this on the market. No, I know Islamic law seems like the whole marriage relationship seems really like a, a, a financial transaction. I cannot deny that. There's no way you can get around it. However, the mahar, the dowry is something just symbolic. It should never be seen as being something where, from both sides, by the way, if it's the mahar of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, which is our role model, her marriage with Imam Ali ibn Talib is, a, is, is, is the marriage that we all look up to. If they demanded a high mahar, then you'd be like, what's the philosophy? They don't demand a high dowry at all. Imam Ali ibn Talib alayhi salam comes with what? With a shield and with a sword and with a horse. That's all he has. But he, like the others, were firm believers. In the verse in the Quran, chapter 24, verse 32, which states, You marry off the single from amongst you. If they are poor, Allah will make them rich. Don't go into this thinking, you know what, let's put a big sum on our daughter because just in case there is a broken relationship we will get that money back first and foremost you're not going to get that money back let me be clear most guys will make it that their bank account doesn't have that money you're not going to get anything back that was a symbolic gesture ahlul bayt are saddened if you look at the traditions when someone asks for a high dowry when you hear some communities in the Muslim world, what was the dowry for your daughter? Oh, I said $100,000, I said $500,000, million dollars. This is, this is saddening. This is something symbolic. And the way some of us have treated, I feel sorry for some people in, in Iraq, for example. You've had 34 years of war. When they want to get married, they're told, listen, pay up $10,000, $15,000 and then we'll give you our daughter. It's not a sign of a spiritual path. Rather, it's a sign of people who have become just immersed in the fact that give me as much money. And that was the exact same time in the days of Jahiliyyah. Days of Jahiliyyah, father-in-law says, whoever pays highest will get, we'll get, we'll get my daughter. daughter. Because the Mahar used to go to the father-in-law until the eye on Surah An-Nisa was revealed. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa'atu nisa saduqatihinna nihla. That you've got to give their dowry truthfully and sincerely towards the woman. So never should our communities ever reach a stage where they ask for a high dowry or are influenced by members of the family when it comes to dowries and so on. Inshallah. Uh, if you're tuning in, don't forget that you can actually call in and put your questions direct to Dr. Said Ammar yourselves. The number to dial is plus four four two zero three five one five zero one nine nine. Alternatively, you can send your messages in via WhatsApp or on our Facebook page. So, Sayyid, now coming back to wedding ceremonies, uh, what's acceptable in terms of wedding ceremonies? Some people in this day and age, for example, hold weddings, play music, have men and women mixed. And I know a few of the elder generation who say we don't go to these events because if we go, then it's us showing solidarity and conforming to these types of behaviors whereas if as a community we decided to you know almost uh, revolt against these types of things then it will stop happening what's the islamic outlook on wedding ceremonies well it's not it's not easy it's not easy to simply put uh, you know uh, a definition as to what's the ideal wedding there are certainly ways in which we can uh, make the event pleasant on a worldly level and on a spiritual level. You see, I love when I go to 
a wedding where, for example, you hear Hadith al kisa being recited. You hear the recital of the Qur'an. Where, for example, you hear a nice talk being given about the merits of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. Where you hear poetry about the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. It may be at a prestigious hotel. But being at that prestigious hotel does not necessarily mean that that person is someone who's a worldly person. That person, on the contrary, has invited the community to share their happiness. That person has ensured that, for example, the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt are remembered on that night. Now, naturally, there is a precautionary measure that people want to adopt Islamically. And that is to make sure that we don't fall into any category where sin can take place at any gathering, not just at a wedding. At any gathering, a person, when they're in charge of that gathering, listen, I can't help myself if I'm going to a gathering which is dictated by, for example, other cultures or other countries. But when it's my own gathering, I can dictate. And I should try and make sure that the way I'm planning this wedding we're not going to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know what, what saddens me sometimes is, for example, if there is a wedding, let's say, and the prayer time comes, some people will move and go and pray. Others will still be immersed on that night, chatting, laughing, joking. Now, there's no harm enjoying yourself that night. But don't forget the very reason you're able to breathe that night is the very existence who you should be going to prostrate to right there and then. It saddens you when a bride and groom are able to stay up on a wedding night, but when it comes to the Fajr morning prayer, they're asleep. It saddens you when, for example, the music which is immoral, not all music, Listen, there's classical music out there, a person can play in the background of a wedding, for example. That's not going to be something that corrupts people. There are, for example, nasheeds of the Ahlul Bayt, which are in the background of a wedding. It's not going to corrupt people. There are folk cultural music, which is not going to corrupt people. But there's no need to bring in music where the language of that music is that which is completely opposite to the teachings of the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt. At the end of the day, your first day getting married, you want to make sure is a blessed day. Now, what happens if you are, for example, at a gathering where all of a sudden you've witnessed a moment or can see that the gathering is heading towards a direction where people may start getting up and dancing in a mixed gathering and so on, which is prohibited in Islamic law. At that moment, you excuse yourself. But don't excuse yourself. You don't have to make a scene when you excuse yourself can politely say that I wish you the best. May God's prayer, may God be with you, our prayers are with you and so on. And that's it, you can move out. There's no harm attending the first part of that wedding as you've received an invite to show your happiness. But if you could tell, well, what's going to happen in the next hour or two is not necessarily that which is reflective of the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, then you could excuse yourself. You don't have to be put in a position of pressure that, well, if you walk out, you're seen as being boring or this. No, don't worry about being boring. Some of the most famous people in the school now are the coolest. Like yourself. Well, you know, I'm a normal guy. You know, I, I'm just a normal guy. But I'm sure there are people who may be cooler than me out there. Maybe. So, when we're looking at this, the religious, which remember I said I don't define the religious as those who pray and fast. And, but those who uphold the moral principles of Ahlul Bayt to the best as they can, they should be seen as role models. You don't have to be scared. Don't think that people are going to look at you in a negative manner. But also, that is not the time and place to tell people what's right or what's wrong. Now, I know that many times I receive emails. I think one of the questions that we received was, well, my cousin's getting married and her wedding is going to be full of, you know, dancing and DJs and I think, you know, these types of things and 
and so on. Well, if you can go and, you know, send your salams at the beginning, and I don't know, they, what do they do? Box gifts, not box gifts, donation, whatever. You could give your gift, and then after that you can excuse yourself. Someone says, but it's my cousin. Quran says that I have to show respect to my family members. Yes, if they are obeying Allah. If there is disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then there is no more in terms of respect, in terms of I have to abide by what they're doing. No, I can excuse myself and say now it becomes a gathering which someone says, well, you sit in these places. Say if I sit, for example, or you sit, for example, or any of us sit in a shisha camp. It's not my control what's happening there, for example. The moment I realize that it's going to a level which is not acceptable, then I have to walk out. If I can see, for example, suddenly a, a group of dancers have walked in, then at that moment, I should find a way, without causing a scene, to excuse myself and Leave. walk out. But like I said, it's the first day of your union. And not a day to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, if you can, try on that day, give a certain amount back towards the poor of the world. Make it a spiritual day as well. Don't be overawed by the fact that I have to be looking a certain way. Or my only concern is, am I in every photo? No, rather try and be bigger than that and have some class. And inshallah. inshallah. Brilliant timing. We have a caller on the line, Sayyidina. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. I think we're having some sure, technical issues. Uh, we'll get them back on the line, inshallah, put them through when they're back. So, carrying on from the wedding, I guess, at the wedding stage now, what are the nikah or aged ceremonies? For example, do there need to be witnesses there present? What, what actually in Jafari, in Jafari law, there is no need for witnesses at the aqid or the nikah ceremony. Some people think that you have to have witnesses uh, in, in Jafari fiqh when it comes to the wedding ceremony. No. You make those two happy. It's a good day out for them and make them feel important for once. But you say on the door of istihbab, maybe you can have people there, but not obligatory. And what you have is someone who will recite what is known as the Aqad ceremony or the Nikah ceremony. At the beginning, praising Allah's creation of Adam. And then how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala joined Eve and Adam together in matrimony. And how from them the human race continues. And then from there, a couple of the quotes of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family and the Ahlul Bayt. For example, the famous quote, of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, and nikahu min sunnati, faman raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni. Marriage is from my teachings. Whoever stays away from it is not one of us. There are people out there who have no interest in ever getting married. No, never tried, not interested in bothering to meet people. So ask them why, I say, I want to get closer to God. It's as of a celibacy type movement. And I remember there was a period where some of the followers of Ahlul Bayt even went through this, where they were like, I'm not going to get married because, for example, Sayyidah Ma'asoom Qom did not get married. And the reply comes from the Imams. If not getting married was a sign of spirituality, then Fatima al-Zahra would not have got married. But Fatima al-Zahra showed us how you could balance marital life in service to the creation, in service to the Creator, and so on. So the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, there's a hadith from him. The eye of the Quran that I mentioned, chapter 24, verse 32, is normally recited. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam's famous tradition um, about whoever gets married completes half of the religion, so he should be conscious of Allah and the other half. And then after that, depends. Normally there are representatives for the bride and the groom. Either one representative who does the nikah, uh, representing, does the aqad representing both. Or the bride chooses someone and the groom chooses someone. Or the bride and the groom take the brave plunge of saying that we'll recite the words in the Arabic language. So you've got these which takes place. Naturally, when we're living in the Western world, there is a registration system that your wedding has to be, your marriage has to be registered. There are laws which a person must revere and must respect while they're living in the country. 
be it a Muslim or a non-Muslim country. Inshallah. I think we've got the caller back on the line, Sayyidina. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, sister. Um, uh, I would like to give my regards to Sayyid Amar Nishwani. And a question I would like to raise is that, is, are there any specific du'as from the Quran or saints from the, from the Ahl Bayt that would kind of um, give us an idea of what a, a pious spouse should be like? And, uh, I mean, specifically any du'as which are in place to find, for someone to find a spouse? Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, look in the Holy Quran for, you know, what type of attributes a person should look for when it comes to, you know, a future partner. As I said, the story of Shu'aib and Musa with Shu'aib's daughter, they looked at him and they said, so they saw two attributes, Qawi and Amin. There's a physical strength. Naturally, physically, one must have looked after themselves. But I mean, he is someone trustworthy. Not someone who opens up their secrets to the whole world. Not someone who will stab you behind their, your back. Not someone who will take your father's money and destroy your whole family. That is one of the best examples of a story in the Holy Quran where you see all of the different attributes which are needed for that marriage to be successful. You look for example in the Holy Quran I, I, I love, for example, the, the, the softness of the wording of the likes of Nabi Yaqub and Nabi Ibrahim salam, in terms of their, their humility when speaking to their children. That is something fundamental, that you're with someone whose akhlaq is good, be it speaking with elders or with youth or with children. You look at Nabi Ibrahim always, Ya Bunay, Nabi Yaqub, Ya Bunay. There's, there's real softness in the way that they are. You know, and then when you're looking at the lives of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, you find that the aim is a spiritual aim. That's fundamental. You know, you could be with someone who's earning big money, but spiritually zilch. Not bothered to go to the mosque, always making excuses. You find, for example, never reading any book to further their knowledge. When you tell them, let's go ziyara, they're always busy. Always making excuses. But if you tell them a, a resort, they're always jumping. And I think it's vital that when you want to look for someone to marry, you want to look for that person who you can find a real spiritual fervor in. Fatwa Zahra السلام, had very renowned personalities proposed for her. But what was unique about Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, is that he has a cognizance of God and a yearning to serve God at a young age. Because remember, she's... On the night that her father is about to be assassinated, and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, is in the bed of the Prophet, she's what, eight years of age at that time? But she sees this young man who does not flinch when her father says to him, are you willing to sacrifice yourself for me and my Lord? And he turns around to him and he says, are you going to be in, in, in peace? Oh, Prophet of God, he said, yes, he said, then. My soul is for you. My body is for you. And I think when you're about to marry someone, ask them the spiritual questions. Where are we heading? Are you content with where you are or do you want to improve? Do you want to move closer to God is, or is our only concern? Uh, Monday, Friday, uh, 8 to 8, uh, buy a four-bedroom house first, then move to a five-bedroom, get the best private school for our kids so we can show them off to the community, and then let them go to high universities. Yeah, but there's many out there. It's quite mundane. Well done if you achieve it. Being there, seeing it. You know, it's good, but that spiritual extra where you're able to take it to that next level, is that person who you're looking for someone like that or no? Therefore, when you're looking at the Holy Quran, not only do you have the attributes of trustworthiness, the attributes of physically having looked after oneself, but you're looking in the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, and you're also seeing this wonderful spiritual fervor. I think, fourthly and very importantly, patience and forgiveness as being attributes of that person. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, had some absolute nightmares with his marriages. You know, there were moments where the Quran, look at chapter 66, 
verse 1, 3, 4, and 5. I ask all the viewers. Chapter 66 of the Quran, verse 1, 3, 4, and 5. If you look at what's happening to the marriage of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, God is virtually telling him, it's up to you now if you want to divorce them. You can imagine what's happened there. But the patience of the Prophet Muhammad, the willingness to forgive the faults of one's partner, these are wonderful attributes as well. Now, I'm not going to say all of these are going to make an ideal marriage. Naturally, a person, what goes inside them, their emotions, their feelings, a person can't control. You either want to be with that person or maybe there's nothing that's clicking. But these are certainly attributes that one can take. In terms of the supplications, duas.org, D-U-A-S.org, is a wonderful website which has many wonderful traditions and supplications and verses of the Holy Quran which one can recite if they are looking to get married. I would recommend the viewers that website. Inshallah. Following on from the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt is, did any of them ever go on a honeymoon? Is honeymoon part of Islam or is it culture? What's the... Well, Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib salam's honeymoon is an interesting one because he's, uh, he's got 63 wounds on his body at Uhud. There's no Maldives, is it? You know, it's um, 63 wounds on his body on the day of Uhud. And his wife is not... Complaining about her five-star tent, or why is it four-star? Why is it not on the beach? Why is it not on the water? Why is the food late? Why is this? Why is the plane? Why is that? No, no, his wife, who just happens to be the greatest woman to have ever existed, is treating the wounds on his body. So, I can't say the Ahlul Bayt were enjoying a wonderful beach resort for their honeymoon. There was a constant, um, it's as if, you know what, it's, it just doesn't do it for them. Um, but that does not mean that it's prohibited. Uh, on the contrary, uh, it, it's wonderful if a person's able to get away with their partner. Uh, hopefully in that first couple of weeks, it's not a period which becomes a nightmare, rather it's a period that becomes uh, a period of happiness. People are tested in different ways, uh, no doubt, uh, in their marriages, but you would hope that that would be the beginning. Some might turn around and say, no, we can save the honeymoon for a later period, work commitments maybe a lot, um, and that is something to consider. Financial commitments, you know, you should just because she went there or he went there doesn't mean all of you have to go somewhere. A person can be patient enough to say, well, at the beginning, let's be patient, save up, work on other things. And then definitely there'll be holiday after holiday uh, afterwards. So there's, there's nothing prohibited. But if you're asking me, Ahlul Bayt wise, uh, 63 wounds on Uhud is uh, as happy a honeymoon as I think he enjoyed it because he served the Holy Prophet on that day. So in terms of, you just mentioned work commitments, work, community, life, balance. That I think is key to any sort of happy marriage to be able to balance all three of them. What would you advise someone to be able to do in order to control those three? Which one would you prioritize one over the other? Well, I, I'm very sad when I find out that many married couples have suddenly disappeared from the community. It's sad. It's sad when there's a whole generation, I, I could say London's one of these generations, where Imam al-Jawad Shahada, I can guarantee you that 70-80% of couples in their 20s and 30s will not go to the mosque. Now, all of a sudden marriage, I don't know, does it make you run away from the mosques or is it that the mosques aren't catering? That requires its own show. But marriage should be that movement in your life of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It should not be a case where a person suddenly says, well, you know what, work is too much. Okay, work is too much. One day a week go. It's a shahad of an imam. It's a wilad of an imam. It's honoring the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. They themselves say, Rahimallahu man ahya amrana. May Allah have mercy on the one who revives our affair. I'm not going to deny people have busy lives. But don't tell me you can't make time for your community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with six-figure wages in some cases. Six-figure salaries. And you can't turn up for Imam al-Jawad shahada or Imam al-Sadiq shahada or Imam Zain al-Abdin shahada. But Muharram, mashaAllah, everybody can turn up. There has to be a healthy balance. Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, if you were to read his biography, there's a wonderful balance between family Community, work, you know, with the iron and so on. Mulayan 
hadith as we read within the supplications. And so you find that balance is also in the life of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. He still earns, but he still looks after his family, but he still serves the community. It's sad when I hear today that people have got married, you don't see them in the mosque for a year. On the contrary, your marriage should spiritually uplift you to work together now in serving the mosque, be it serving food, be it organizing lectures, be it helping the elderly, be it charity fundraising, be it helping the local community. So in those first days, don't fall into, and even if you are a group of married couples, you've recently been married, at least organize weekly gatherings. We hear that there are brothers and sisters newly married who organize weekly gatherings and these have to continue. Whatever you do, don't let your marriage become a movement away from the community. Some people complain. It's a community full of hypocrites, community is backward. Okay, if the community is like that, then you work on building a brighter community. Inshallah. So now we've gone past the honeymoon stage. The, our imaginary couple have gone on the honeymoon comeback. Now they're living in their own flat or house and they've got in-laws to deal with. What are the rights of the in-laws over the husband or the wife? None. None? In some cultures, the in-laws, for example, Asian backgrounds, they want to come and live with them. Is that... Cultures could do whatever they want. Religiously, there's no... You know, you don't have to... A wife who's just got married does not have to serve anybody. Your love for them as being the parents of your husband, for example, that would reach a level where you want to help and support. But you're not obliged. Let's make this clear. That this idea that we'll marry a girl so she serves my dad who's 70 years old, that's got nothing to do with religion. That's you building an ideal home for yourself. That girl does not have to serve anyone. If she is, and she already knew, that she's going to marry a family where the in-laws live at home, which has to be discussed beforehand, because some will complain afterwards, well, didn't you know before you got married that the in-laws are living there? And I think those who try and make this claim that, you know what, you have to respect your in-laws, yes, respect anyone who obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you respect them. They disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't have to obey them. Respect, akhlaq should always remain. Always you found Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas would not leave Umm al-Banin alone after Umm al-Banin had become a widow. Remember, she, for over 20, 20 years, she lived with Abu al-Fadl. They did not leave her alone. And nor did Abu al-Fadl's wife, Lubaba, say, I don't want my mother-in-law. No. The akhlaq was there, but legally there is no obligatory duty on her to have to. But akhlaq-wise, Islam dictates you soften your heart. And you try and lower your wings towards the elderly. Yeah. What about in terms of if you, for example, marry a first cousin, your in-laws become your uncle or aunt, you go through, God forbid, a messy divorce, the, your uncle or aunt then starts to maybe spread rumours about you, speak ill about you. And obviously in Islam we have this Salat al-Rah where you have to see your family once every, I think, three months. What on your neck then, what obligations do you have to abide by, what do you have to follow, what do you do in that situation? Well, many face this situation, sadly, it happens where there's a marriage between the cousins, breaks up, it causes friction and tension for a while. Uh, you don't have to go and see those cousins who you may have fallen out with. You can maintain salam with them, for example. That could be Salat al-Rahim, salamu alaykum, send a WhatsApp message. Salams, hope you're well. They reply, they reply, they don't reply. It's between them and God. Or even asking about them and hoping that they're well. Or even praying for them is still Salat al-Rahim. So Salat al-Rahim is not this thing where a person has to maintain some sort of communication by physically being present in front of the person. A phone call, a message, asking about them. This is all Salat al-Rahim as well. But try your hardest not to let the shaitan get in your way and say, never talk to them again. Don't welcome them at home again. This is not right. Rather, we should try and keep our hearts soft. We may have been hurt. We may have been oppressed. 
But try and soften your heart in the way that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, both when they faced an uncle who they felt oppressed by, try to soften their heart with that uncle on many occasions. Inshallah. A question that came in over the weekend, Sayyidina, was regarding uh, war-torn countries, widows, orphans, etc. And it says, in some war-torn countries, it's encouraged to have multiple wives due to the orphans and widows left behind. What are your thoughts about polygamy there and in the West? And a follow-on question is about why are men allowed to marry four women, but women only allowed to marry one man? Well, if there's a war-torn country today, there, were, there was a war-torn um, environment in early Islam. And so when the polygamy law is seen in early Islam, it's because there are a number of orphans because of the fact that their fathers have died at Badr or at Uhud or later at Khandaq or at Khaybar. Now these widows who are there, could not just go out and get themselves a job at that time. Listen, 15 years ago, they were, some of them were being buried alive. They're not just going to automatically get a job at that time. So if you were married to one, you were given the permission to marry a second because of that particular situation that occurs. Has that type of context stopped? Not at all. Until today, you have situations where there are war-torn environments. You look at Iraq, you look at Bosnia, you look at... For example, Afghanistan, you look at Lebanon, there is a, a, you know, many widows out there with no one to fend for them. And that could be a situation where polygamy applies. If in the West polygamy is allowed, then you abide by the laws. If it's not allowed, then you abide by the laws. In Islam, it's not just easy for a person to say, okay, I'm going to marry a second wife. Second wife, if you're going to marry her financially, you have to treat both wives exactly the same. Monetarily, exactly the same. Physically, likewise, you have to make sure that you cater for both. Yes, your time should be for both exactly the same. Spend three and a half days here, three and a half days there. If you are able to, you know, have such strength and not suffer from migraines, then take, you know, take that second one on board and also try and maintain justice. Someone says in the Quran, Allah says you can never achieve justice in polygamy. Yeah, you can never love the two the same. That's impossible. I can't say to the first wife, I love you 71%, I love the second one 29 But in terms of finance and in terms of time, you can certainly achieve a balance, however hard it may be. What was the norm for Ahlul Bayt, The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, in his lifetime. His norm was monogamy, not polygamy. When he was 25 years old, he married Sayyidah Khadija, alayhi 26 years he was married to her, did not marry any other lady, until the age of 51. He could have married, he was in the prime. He could have married, but he did not marry anybody else while he was married to Khadija. Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam. And likewise, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib would not have married anyone had Fatwa and Zahra alayhi salam remained alive. So therefore, when we look at the Ahlul Bayt, the norm was monogamy. Polygamy was dictated because of certain legal issues, political issues, tribal alliances. Yes, these things can happen. But as I said, one has to recognize that there are ethical as well as legal ramifications to such a decision. Inshallah. Thank you very much My for pleasure. another insightful night. Uh, thank you for tuning in at home. Inshallah, we'll be back uh, on Friday night with Live in London with Dr. Said Aman Akshwani discussing another topic. Please keep us in your du'as. We look forward to seeing you on Friday, inshallah. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.